Hi everyone! Welcome back to the third episode, which is the last episode for series Fokota Sutosa. So, in the past few episodes, we talk about millennials and Kota Sentosa itself. So, for today's episode, we will we will get to know more about you as a politician. So, um, as you can see, some people, especially people like me, we um, we're not that familiar with um, politics stuff. So, I hope you can enlighten us about it. Um, the first question I'm going to ask you is because um, you're representing SUPP, right? So, what is SUPP? Well, SUPP is a political party and it is the oldest political party in Sarawak. And uh, if you go back to our history, SUPP actually... The movement of SUPP actually did not want to be part of Malaysia if you actually go back long enough in history. Mm -hmm. We wanted an independent Sarawak, in inverted commas, at that material point in time. Mm -hmm. you know? But over the years, obviously, the, the philosophy has changed. And uh, if you look at our party song, we want a fair and just society. So that particular philosophy, a fair and just society, is the thing that actually attracted me to join SUP. What is your philosophy in politics? Okay, you see, I studied politics in university. I have a degree in politics. Mm -hmm. And politics is about, personally for me, politics is about making society better. And um, when I was in university, I read through all those books, you know, like uh, the first book that I read was The Prince, you know, Machiavelli, The Ends Justify the Means. But that particular book never attracted me. I was more inclined into the works of social justice. And if you ask me what social justice is, social justice is a mechanism or a philosophy, if you, if you like to use the word, whereby everybody should be given equal opportunities in life. Okay? Yeah. So currently, if you look at our political scenario now, Actually, I want to change it because I feel that everybody is born equal. Whether you're Malay, you're Chinese, you're Indian, whatever. You know, we are all born equal. And my philosophy is that a government that is formed, policies that the government makes, all those policies must cater to the masses. That's my philosophy. And then, to be honest with you, I'm attracted by the work, by the, the speeches of uh, Nick uh, Aziz, you know, the, the spiritual, the, the, he's, he's no longer around, the mm -hmm. spiri spiritual leader of caste at that point in time. And I, to now, I still remember what he said, you know. He says that, uh, you know, policy should not cater, for example, kalau ada tiga orang baik. Satu bayi Cina, satu bayi Melayu, satu bayi India. Mm -hmm. Dan kalau bayi itu menangis kerana kelaparan, kamu di sini, yang duduk di sini, yang sedang mendengar apa yang saya cakap tu, can you tell me? Boleh tak kamu beritahu saya? Sama ada bayi yang menangis kerana kelaparan, yang memerlukan susu tu, bayi India kah? Bayi Cina kah? Bayi Melayu kah? Mm, I wouldn't know. You see, but... so when a baby cries for milk, yeah. because that baby is hungry, nobody knows whether he's Indian, he's Chinese, he's Malay. You know? Yes. So, as a government, we must cater to the needs of the people, regardless of race. So, if you if you were to ask me, basically, I do not subscribe to some of the policies that are currently being implemented in our country because I feel that policies must cater to the masses, must assist the people that needs the aid and then after they're able, you bring them up, for example if they're poor, you give them the assistance, lift them up from that poverty 
-hmm. Then, when they're able to stand on their own two feet, then you slowly parrot palip the assistant. So, Nick Aziz once said, Kalau itu orang sudah ada kereta dua tiga, rumah besar sini sana, do you think that our policies should still cater for those kind of people? Mm. No, right? Mm. So, so that, that, that is what attracted me. That policies going forward should be fair. And if I'm given the opportunity, these are the kind of things that I want to change in society. I want to make people realize, understand that when it comes to politics, when it comes to running a government, when it comes to speaking in parliament in a state assembly, assistance to the needs of the people must be of primary importance. And sometimes my friends would argue with me to say that, yeah, but you know, but we we got the NEP, we got the NDP, you know, you you are you are not. Uh, you know, certain privileges is already written into the constitution. Yes, but if you look at the fine print of the NEP, the original fine print of the new economic policy, which has been changed to the NDP, you find that the original purpose was actually to assist the poor. And then over the years, it, it just shifted towards this thing called ketuanan, whatever. And that's something which I don't subscribe to. I'm very sorry, even though I'm part of uh, the government. Mm. But these are things that I want to change from within. That we need to slowly, slowly change those policies to cater for the masses. And then our countries should should strive to be truly Bangsa Sarawak, Bangsa Malaysia, where everybody feels that they have a part. And, you know, Adinan once said, Sarawak is big enough for everybody. Yes. And I truly believe in what our late Adinan said, that Sarawak is big enough for everybody. The resources that Sarawak has can cater to everybody. And that is something that I want to pursue in Parliament, in the State Assembly, in my political career. It sounds a huge mountain to climb, but it's okay because if we want to reach Rome, you know, mm -hmm. it starts with the first step. People are always resistant to change. People do not want change. People are scared of change. Even though the opposition talks about change. But in the 22 months that they were in power at the federal level, there was not much change. The existing policies continue. And uh, going back, you know, they were given that opportunity. In fact, the, the Rakyat gave them that mandate, but they goofed up on that mandate. Because from their populist statements and from looking at what they did in the 22 months, that they were given that opportunity by the Rakyat, that they were given that trust of the life, Rakyat, they actually betrayed the trust. Because the change that they preach about turned out to be nothing but pure rhetoric. So, Uncle, what makes you different from the other potential candidates? Well, Sandra, I can't blow my own trumpet, mm -hmm. okay? But if there is one thing, I'm a man of my words. And I believe that if given the opportunity, what I just told you just now, mm -hmm. I will definitely be pursuing that. And if you look in Kota Sentosa, what has the people there got to lose, the voters there got to lose. Give me an opportunity, give me a chance. After all, you have given the opposition 15 years time frame to bring the change that they promised that they would bring. And they have not delivered. And the 22 months that they were in power, before they came into power, they had a Buku Jinga. I read the Buku Jinga, the orange book. They promised what? They promised that 50% of all the taxes collected in Strauss would be given back to Strauss. They promised 20% oil royalty. They promised the recognition of UEC. In fact, you know what they promised? They said that if you gave us a chance in Stampin, 
the parliamentary constituency of Stampin. Your, your, your road lamps would be made of diamonds. Your roads can be made paved with gold. Of course, they spoke in Chinese in a rhetoric, rhetorical way. But a lot of people believed them that they were able to deliver the change. But obviously, all that was just nothing. It was just basically false hope. So, Sandra, mm -hmm. okay, if I'm given that opportunity, if there is anything that I can promise the people of Kota Sentosa, I can promise them that they will be better off by giving another person a chance. So, Uncle, can you elaborate more on the 22 months when the oppositions were in charge? Well, I vividly remembered the finance minister at that time, uh, YB Lim Guan A, came to Strawa and said that Strawa is going to be bankrupt in three years. So that, that really pissed me off. And then, uh, instead of helping, you know, you, you, you just piled on those kind of uh, uh, irrelevant rhetoric on the people of Strava, insulting Strava. And then you took away funding for bridges. You know, the two bridges, Batang Sadong and Batang Lupa. And then the state government had to come up with their own money to actually complete the project. And those two bridges were essential for connectivity. Because... You see, people living in the rural areas, obviously they needed those bridges, right? So if you're talking about rural development, don't you think that those two bridges were very crucial for rural development? Then the final thing that I want to share with you is dilapidated uh, schools. You know, on the one hand, politicians were complaining about dilapidated schools in the rural areas and in the suburban areas. And what did they do with it? They played politics with it. Until the state government had to prepay a $1 billion loan. And until now, the project is still Kuchakache. I don't know where it is. Either. So we still have a lot of dilapidated schools. So I think policies, you know, if you can see the action in the implementation of policies, you begin to find that, you know, they were off tangent. On the one hand, they said this. But when it came to doing the thing and given the opportunity to do the thing for the good of the people, they never did. And it was just politicking the whole way. And I feel that that's wrong. Because as politicians and as a Walker Rakyat and as YBs, people first. Rakyat misti di And rhetoric, quarrelling within the party, all those things should be, should be the very last on a genuine politician's So everyone, I hope from the last few episodes, you get to understand Mr. Wilfred, his visions and mission for the people. Perhaps give him a chance, opportunity to make a difference for Kota Sentosa. And this has been Serious for Kota Sentosa.